is Caleb. This is Caleb. Okay. Um, Ambrose is the border collie. And um, oh, Caleb's, yeah. Caleb's really smart for a mastiff, but um, Ambrose is very smart. All right. Well, what I'll do is I'll uh, start to share and then open the notebook and we can still wait for people. Okay. Yeah, that works. I do wish uh, they would get, um, how do I say this? I wish they would get Zoom working the same way on Linux that it does on Windows. It does work a little more streamlined on Windows with the uh, extra people window. Mm -hmm. if there's another way I can make it more. Let's see. Trying other things. I don't think it's going to let me do it. Okay. Oh, well, it's good enough. Okay, so I, I think we can start. Let me just put the link. Very good. Yeah, we're good. So let's okay. See. Can you guys see this? Absolutely. Go oh, uh, to 100%. That seems to be best. Okay. I am not going to compete with the best teacher in the world on linear algebra. I'm going to partner with him. So here is the section in Khan Academy's linear algebra that we're covering today. So what we're doing is we're augmenting Saul Khan's outstanding lectures on this first section um, with NumPy. And I think that if you will go through his videos and do his practice sets and then transfer those practice sets into Google Colab using NumPy, the way I'm going to show you, along with Matt, uh, Plot Live, you are going to get a ton out of this and become junior linear algebra gurus. And linear algebra is a beautiful mathematical art. <clears throat> so I don't think also, also that if you haven't already watched these lectures, um, you're not really going to miss anything, okay? Um, but I do encourage you, go back through and watch them, and then go back through this notebook, and then take this notebook to the next levels. And this, is, uh, this notebook's on its maiden voyage. I haven't shared this one with anyone yet. So... Uh, I think we'll make some improvements that I thought of as we go through. <clears throat> now, let's talk of, oh, and these are all links to those videos. But if you just go to this section, that's probably the best thing to do. And let me go in and show you that. These, these are the video lectures, and these are the practice sessions you can do. And next time, we will do a couple more sections. But let's go back to our notebook for now. So vectors have direction and magnitude. Now, if you're hearing that for the first time, that's okay. Let it sink in. You'll get it over time. But let's think of some common vectors real quick. Um, how far you go? Now, if I just say, oh, I went five miles, you might think, okay, yeah, so Tom, but where did you go five miles? From where to where? Well, 
with vectors, it doesn't matter where they start from. So I could give you a vector that I've traveled by saying, I walked five miles east. I just described a distance vector. Or you could call me on the phone and say, hey, Tom, what are you doing? Oh, I'm driving east at uh, 75 miles per hour on uh, an interstate in the United States, an interstate highway. That's another vector. Now, it's a whole nother matter when you, you start to say where they start from, but we don't need to know where vectors start from in order to do math with them. We just need to know their direction and their magnitude. And this will become more clear, but think of some other things that are vectors that you know about. In other words, what are some vectors that you know about and what is their direction? And I, I gave a couple examples, but do that on your own. Now we're gonna introduce something that Saul introduces later in his videos in this section, but I have is a unit vector in the X direction. So when I say five I hat, I'm saying a magnitude of five in the I hat direction or in the X direction. And X is gonna be a direction that we define. Excuse me. So here are our X's. Um, right now we have a white line being drawn through this plot. And I thought, I was thinking of a way so it's just, uh, it doesn't cross through our vector. And uh, so a little trick we can do uh, every time is to draw a very uh, short line um, in, by the way, I'm controlling the X range this way. I'm controlling the Y range this way. So this is, uh, a vector, excuse me, a range in X, <laughs> just two points <clears throat> along X, two points along Y. So our two points are two, one and nine, four. But just to make this um, so it, we can still get the same range, let, let's do this. We're gonna go from two to 2.1. And uh, you know, before I do this, by the way, this is just a trick so that we can use Matplotlib for these demonstrations. But, you know, the tools, at least a tool that we can use to help us, uh, that's important. So I'm going to say 2.1 here. So it'll be real. In fact, I'm going to even be more ridiculous. 2.01. Or even, I'm just going to make a very tiny line segment, in other words. And this one will be 1.001. But over here, I'm going to go from 8.999 to 9 and 3.999 to 4. Now, <clears throat> I have two really tiny line segments right near 2 and 1 and right near uh, 9. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, what did I do? And then at uh, right near nine and four. So when I rerun this, I'll get rid of that little faint white line through here. But let's also look at what we're doing. We have a direct, we're calling the component for the vector V. Oh, and do take the time to learn some latex math. You can see in here, I've got a vector V defined and I've got a hat over I, and then um, I've got I hat by itself here. So do take the time to learn that when you go through these notebooks and make a copy. These are view only, but you should be able to make a copy of them and then make them your own, specialize them. Okay, so just like we said, I'm gonna take V the, the I component of V and it's five. Now I haven't introduced it yet, but J would be a unit vector in the Y direction. Oh yes, thanks Hugo. I'm watching the chat too. 
So now that we've started this plot in Matplotlib, <clears throat> we're going to draw an arrow. We're going to start at 3, 2 in our coordinate plane. And we're going to go uh, a, a distance of vi and vj. Again, this is the x component of the vector and the y component. And that's the power of vectors. We can break them up into orthogonal components. Now, what's orthogonal mean? It means with the math that we use, they are perfectly independent from one another. So when you look at the xy plane, x, y, z, x, y, z with the right hand rule, um, all of these are perpendicular to one another. So this, these two, x is perpendicular to y, it forms a plane, and then z is perpendicular to that plane. And we could have defined any other two planes, but always once we draw one of these planes, the remaining vector is perpendicular to it. That Pro that property of being perpendicular and all of that, that's orthogonality. Very important to our math. Now, <clears throat> just thinking ahead, can we work with more than three dimensions? Absolutely. Can they be independent of one another? Yes. But it's at that point, we don't really visualize it because we think in 3D when we're thinking the physical realm and in physics, but there are realms in data science all the time where we work with more than three dimensions. And you can absolutely set those up, be independent. In fact, what inspired this lecture is the family's love for principal component analysis, which has to do with eigenvalues. And we see that if we take uh, feature variables and do linear algebra type transformations just so, we can get a feature set related to our original feature set that are completely independent of one another. So enough of that for now. And you will learn more as you listen to Saul. He will reinforce it. I figure why redo what Saul's already done. So I'll just rerun this guy and boom. Oh, look, I got that beautiful. In fact, just for fun, let's see if we can even see these. I will just take this out. They might be so short, we can't even see them, but they'll probably show up as a die. Yep, there's our little dot up here in the corner and there, but we might as well keep them white, right? So that's our little family trick to use Matplotlib so we can draw vectors, all right? It doesn't have, but we're, we're not proprietary people. We will share that trick with the world. Okay, now I have a second vector, V2, and it is composed of two components, 3i and 4j, whereas I promised you j is a unit vector in the y direction. <coughs> Excuse me. But what is the magnitude of V2? Well, it was easy up here with V1. We can see the magnitude is 5 and the direction was i hat. But down here, we're going off in two components. Well, not a problem. We use the Euclidean norm. And we say, because these are orthogonal to one another, it's like a right triangle. And so it, it, it actually does form a right triangle to get the magnitude. So it's 3 squared plus 4 squared, which equals 9 plus 16, which equals 25 and the square root of 25 is five. Now, obviously I chose those for mathematical convenience and hopefully you all know about the three, four, five triangle, which is, is a nice way to show things, but these values could have been anything, right? So we'll exploit that through the rest of this lecture. Now, let's repeat our little trick from above again. So this time, I'm going to have 0 0.001, oops, and um, I'm going to have uh, 8, actually, how did I do it up there, did I, yeah, we'll just do it that way again. Um, 
0.8.001. And then down here, we'll do the opposite like we did up there. So this will be just before five. And this will be just before eight. Keeps it clean space-wise too. And that'll get rid of that artifact. Okay, so now I've got the three, four, and I started at location one, two in our coordinate plane. And there's my uh, two components that will give me length five. In other words, if we measured that with a ruler <laughs> that had uh, the correct units, you can see it's skewed because of these scales not being exact. Um, and, and by the way, you could change this um, and get the figure dimensions just so, but we don't need to do that. We're mathematicians. Uh-oh. Okay, help me figure out my mistake. <clears throat> Well, before I was going from zero to eight. Oh, let's think about what I how I did it up here. Eight, two, okay. And then point two. Well, I'm a little confused. We'll figure it out here soon. I think um, so. Vi will be plotted on x, and Vj would be plotted on y, and Vj uh, star is four. It, that's the length, right? Uh, yeah. This, these these two are the yeah. starting point. These two are the magnitudes from that starting point in each uh, direction. But there's I'm, no start. Gonna, oh, so yeah. the y-axis, it starts with seven and ends with eight, right? So there's no one and two, if that makes sense. If I'm reading that. Yeah, part. but it it's it's going. Let's see. Yeah, I, I'm listening carefully to you. We just want a small jump in uh, x. I see. A small and a small movement in y. And then we're just trying to get at the corners here. So this is at the at this corner, like we showed here. I haven't rerun that one. So those are those tiny line segments. And so I'm trying to think, what did I do wrong here? Um, if I go, I, I'm just wanting to go from four to eight. So I wonder. That is really interesting. I should, oh, let me think about this again. This is our span in X. This is our span in Y for the, oh, oh, yes, I see what's wrong. Um, let's see, I think I can back out of this. So, back out of both of them. Yeah, I see what I did wrong now. So what I should have done, <clears throat> let's go all the way out so y'all can see what I did wrong. I need a small span for the first two numbers. So this should have been, I feel so silly now, but I like y'all to see me make mistakes because I am a real person, 0.001. And then down here, we, we lean toward the right two numbers. So then we do this one. That's what I did wrong. And I think that'll fix us. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so let's all help Tom remember that. We're, we're staying near that first uh, end of the line that's forming our coordinate plane, and then toward the second end. <laughs> Okay. Well, could, uh, yeah. Could you uh, explain the breakdown of uh, code nine four and five again? Um, I'm not sure oh, if I get it. You mean up here? Uh, or or right here? here. Yeah, right here. Oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. So before, 
we were going from zero to five on the X axis. And, or we were starting it, uh, we were starting at zero and uh, four and five. Uh, wait a minute. Nope. Let me think here. You know what? Let's do a trick here. I'm going to copy this. I just hit control C and now I'm going to do control Z to go back to what we had before. Oops. Okay. Before I was going from zero, zero to five, eight and with a white line. In fact, Let's let's do this so this is all very clear because I do want y'all to understand this because it's a trick. It's a graphical trick we're using to make all this more clear for us. So that was step one. The next step, and, and I've got two lines there, so really I should have done this. And then I get the blue line. The second line was the second color and it was covering up the blue line. Um, now, when I, when I make it white, I, I take it away, but it, it, it kind of gives us this artifact through here. So I'm cheating. <clears throat> I'm saying, instead of going from zero, zero to five, eight, I am going to go from, I'm going to have a, I'm going to go from zero, zero to 0.01 to, to a thousandth and a thousandth. And then I'm going to go just before five and just before eight to five and eight. That way I have two little tiny line segments if, uh, just to make it a little more obvious because I really want you all to see this. I'm going to go ahead and just make them uh, one and uh, four and seven. So now there'll be little short line segments at the low end and the, the top end. And let's make sure we can see them. So again, it's just a trick. And then, but instead, I'm going to just make them really tiny like we did and there we go oh yeah oh sorry oh perfect now this way it's just like this but they're just really tiny near there and near here they're just super short and they're white and now they're out of our way does that make sense Come off mute and let me know, or, or or put it in the chat. Yes, yes, it does make sense. Excellent. Yeah, because I I, I got to tell y'all, sometimes little things like that, I have to slow my mind down and and think, what am I really doing here? And I'm cheating. I'm just making these tiny segments so I can control this range. Now we could have controlled the range. Uh, there's another way to do it. I could set uh, plot x limb and Y limb. So there's other ways to do it. I just did it this way real quick. Okay, so now we're drawing that. We're starting at one, two, and then we're going the magnitude of VI and VJ. And then these are just uh, controls. You can change the color and the head uh, width and the, uh, the width of the line. All right, so, well, can we add two vectors? If they are of like kind, yes. Like, I can't say uh, add a distance vector to a velocity vector in my previous example. Oh, I walked five miles northeast. Well, I'd need to break that down. You know, um, let's, maybe I could say, but the components of that, the, the amount of northeast was uh, three miles north and four miles east. And now that's my five miles northeast. Um, but see, I, I would have to give specific degrees, right? So we knew the direction. And then there's some other math we can do to break it into its components. But if I said, well, let's add that distance I walked to the speed I walked. No, no, they have to be like vectors. So let's say these are two velocity vectors. Maybe this is the velocity of a sailboat. 
and this is the wind velocity or something like well yeah we can't do that exactly either but um the we will try to use some real physical examples that make sense of how we would add vectors. And a lot of times the easiest way to do this is with force, but we'll come back to that. We're just gonna look at the math for now. Well, what is the magnitude of V2? Well, first of all, the component, or excuse me, of some vector V3 that's V1 plus V2. Well, oh, and I should have said, uh, Tom made a, an error here. We want to say magnitude of. So I'll cheat and copy that. I, I just put that in my keyboard buffer. And I'll go on ahead and put that over here so I can change that to an R vert. The, the capital V makes it a double bar. If you use a, a little v, it'll make it a single bar. But I could have just also said, and let's do that right now before I forget about it. Well, what's the, I, I can we can we add the two vectors? I should have put that here, but we can take away all this extra magnitude related symb symbology symbols, and um, we'll just add v one plus v two. <clears throat> we're just adding them so we don't need the square root anymore. We don't need to square them. We're just adding the two components. And then here, um, we should say it's actually, I want to cheat again. So I'm going to just copy that. This needs to be a J. And then that's going to be three and four. So let's copy that. But we're going to replace these with three and four. Okay, are we good? Oh, do y'all know what I'm missing? just the dollar sign there, and that fixes it. So that's how we add those. Oh, and I could have had the square brackets around it, which is a, it's a good thing to do. Um, so <laughs> make myself laugh. I was around during the beginning of computer CAD work. I mean, I was growing up around its inception and early in my career. And it got so realistic sometimes that when I rotated a 3G object and it went below the boundary of the screen, it fooled me and I would do this to see if I could look at it. Was, it reminded me of that when I was trying to edit the, uh, the this side instead of this is where you have to edit that stuff just made me laugh at myself okay so now we'll do all of that uh with code i've got um let's divide this up so i've got v1 defined here v1i v1j v2i v2j <clears throat> and i'm going to add these up oh and let's do our trick again so you'll make sure I don't mess up this time. We start on this end. And then we work on the other side. Just before these second numbers each time. So that would be six. Um, and so we're going to add those two vectors. So we'll show the two vectors on the screen and then uh, we will just add the components and then we finally get into some numpy to help us out we say numpy in the lin alg 
module, get me the norm function, and the norm function takes vector components <clears throat> and finds that Euclidean norm. And so we're going to go on ahead and do some fancy printing here. That was a best. And we're going to just call this stuff. So notice what I'm doing. When I have these, I don't, I can't use the F at the same time, like we use in um, Python printing. And I can't use R and F together. So and at least I don't think I can. So to get away with using this backslash, I have to use the R. And I don't, I want these curly brackets to be, treat, be treated like we're working with um, latex. And so, oh, and send me a direct message in Slack or on LinkedIn. If you're having trouble getting your CoLab to do latex math, I'll send you all the installs you need to do inside CoLab to get yours working. By the way, well, I'll show you, remind, you go remind me to show everyone a trick about how to use CoLab like a Linux terminal. It's super cool. All right, right but this, sec, this second part, I want the curly brackets to replace my value that we calculated right here uh, for this uh, statement that we're gonna put in here. So I'll run all that and boom, yep. We calculated five like we knew it should be using this. And <clears throat> we uh, stuff is what we're gonna uh, put here with plot.txt. So this is your next new thing. Start at one one and at a font size of 14 and horizontally aligned left, print stuff. That's all this is doing. Okay. How do you find the magnitude of a vector in NumPy? Well, I just showed you use norm, short for Euclidean norm. So um, can I ask a question? Yes. I could you scroll Always. up a little? Um, so just to clarify, um, just to make sure that I get it, the code on yeah. line four and five, we need this to come up with a coordinate system. Yeah, it's my, you could have just plotted one of these mm -hmm. and, and then defined uh, X lim and Y lim. In fact, let's do that when we get to the end of the lecture. Let's come back and, and test that because that, that might be a cleaner way to do what I'm doing. However, that's going to take uh, three lines. This only takes two, but we have to type more. So it's, it's up to you, but yeah, it's just, again, we're, we're drawing little tiny segments down here, right in that region and right up here, just to fake this out. But again, there's other ways to do it, but that's all that's for. And um, when I finish answering a question, I never assume that I answered it well enough. So always give me a, a follow-up question please, if you didn't get it, or say, I got it now. And that helps me know it's okay to go on. Yes, definitely. I, I'm going to I'm gonna need to try this um, oh. to make sure that I, I get it. Uh, right now, I'm just listening to you and just watching it. I will definitely uh, send you a follow-up question um, in case I have a question. Perfect. Thank you. And, and let me, and, and you go, you, you need to help me always, always uh-oh. I can hear myself. Thank you. <laughs> Always remember uh, to remind everyone, these notebooks don't have too much value until you play with them, until right. you make sure you step through and understand each individual step. That's when they begin. And then you, when you can really relate them back to Saul's lectures, then you're becoming, you're on the path to mastery. Um, I, I became very convinced, uh, even as an undergrad, I don't really understand the math until I can automate it with code. And, you know, y'all have heard my horror stories about learning to program initially with Fortran on punch cards. I'll tell you what, compared to what we had before then, that was a godsend. That was amazing. And I would still take that over nothing. <laughs> But this is so much better nowadays. All right, let's go on. Thank so you. So how do you find that? Oh, you're welcome. 
How do you find the magnitude of a vector in NumPy? You use norm, which is short for you. Nuclid, nu, I can say it, Euclidean norm after Euclid, the famous Greek geometrist or the, the original geom, uh, not the original geometry guy, but he sure brought all the geometry knowledge together during that time. And it's phenomenal. The book he wrote is pretty much still the material we use today. It's, it's so well done. But now let's just define V1 <clears throat> in NumPy. So there it is, 2, 2. Well, we might have flipped it around. And V2 is 1, 2. And V3, we get to just say V1 plus V2, get out of here. Really? Well, yeah, really, 3, 4. And then, okay, well, what's the magnitude of V3? Oh, we get to put that in. This feels like cheating. Sure does feel like cheating to me. There we go, V3 mag, five. Well, how do we scale vectors in NumPy as Saul Khan shows us in those videos? Oh, look, just multiply four times V1. No way, I can't believe, get out of here. That's stupid easy, yep. That's why, you know, you gotta be careful here. If you don't understand the stuff above, and you don't know linear algebra yet, and you're just doing this, you're like, you, it's just like, but but how would I use that? <laughs> and but this is so cool because it's literally taking three and four, or excuse me, we should go up here, two and two and multiply it by four, and there it is, eight, eight. And then it's taking one and two and multiplying it by four, and there it is, four, eight. And sure enough, does the same thing every time. That's what I love about code. Now, how can we simply add our scale vectors? Same way, we're just repeating what we did above. And isn't that interesting? We scaled the magnitude the same amount. Get out of here, that's too easy. All right, now let's get a little more esoteric. I like to say that word. What is a unit vector for a vector? Well, if we take all the components of that and divide it by our magnitude, we can get what we call unit vectors. So I'll run these for all the vectors we played with above and look at that. Now, hopefully y'all are recognizing this as the square root of two over two. But in case you hadn't memorized that, no big deal. Now look at this. If this is that three, four thing, and it, because if I multiply each of these by five, which that was the magnitude, I get three and four back. That's the power of a unit vector. I, I preserve the direction, and then I can multiply by a magnitude of any magnitude by by any scalar value that is and go the same direction so just like i was saying <clears throat> we had five here but after we scaled that by four we had 20. and so if i multiply this by five i get three and four if i multiply this by 20 i get 12 and 16, I can't remember. Yeah, 12 and 16. All right. And so why are they called unit vectors? If you find their norm, their norms will always equal one. If they true, if they are truly unit vectors. So I'm going to ask y'all to agree that this is essentially one because I didn't want to write all the round statements. That's that's close enough to one. Okay. Come off mute and tell me you disagree, but I think that's that's essentially one. So all I did for each of these vectors is make sure that if I took their Euclidean norm, they were indeed a magnitude of one. That means I can scale them. Now, don't fall into the trap of thinking you can only multiply them by something greater than one. Oh no, this is a unit vector. So any number multiplied by one is that same number. So I could say 0 0.5 now, multiply that, and 
it would be 1.5 and 2 for the components of that. Oh, wait, hang on. That's not right. That's if I had multiplied those by 2.5. So if I multiply it by 0.5, these would be, of course, uh, 0.3 and 0.4. The components would be. So basically, if you multiply your unit vectors by a magnitude or scalar, that is, you will get a vector in the same direction with a different magnitude. But the magnitude can be less than one now. It can be tiny, kind of like what we did up there. Okay, let's go back up here and test the other method. So I want you all to watch. I, I can't remember hardly anything, so I'm going to do a search. Num, uh, not NumPy. Uh, Mat, plot line, not arrow, but uh, x limb. I just can't remember. Okay, so our alias, we can use plt x limb. We're going straight to the documentation. And we just say left and right. <clears throat> and the same thing will be true for y limb. So we'll go back over here. And um, we're just doing a bogus plot here. But what I'll do is I'll, I'm doing a control slash to get that commented out really quickly. Now I'm going to do plot x limb. Okay, so we're going to go from, what did we do? Get out of the way. Uh, zero to five. Then we're going to go for the y limb from, uh, zero to seven. Oh, but not there. I'm going to do it on the next one. But the, the thing is, we have to plot something. You can't, I wish we could just say arrow, but um, it's not set up that way. Arrow is something you add to an already done plot. And sure enough, there's our other way to do this. So I could just put that at the end um, to show that. So that now we have two different ways we can do this. Now there is another trick you can do. So it's on fewer lines. You can do a semicolon like that. That's not PEP eight, but it works. So I I I don't believe in being a, a I hate to well I'll just do it PEP eight Nazi or, or you know a PEP eight Pharisee you know. It, you don't you don't have to always do PEP8. Your code will still run if you don't. But that's how you can use the same number of lines as this other method. All right. Thank you so much for showing that. Oh, yeah. And guys, this is a gentle intro. And if you if you will go and watch all these lectures and do all of these practice sections. And then what could you do after that? So I'm not going to give homework and let me explain why. I don't want to grade it, <laughs> but you guys should get together and play with this notebook. And what we'll start with next week is if anyone wants to show off some new tricks they did with their notebook. <clears throat> now, if I get private messages asking me, Tom, how do you do those video, those dynamic plot videos on your posts? I'll share with you all the tricks so you can do all of it in CoLab. Uh, so if I saw some moving vectors next week, <laughs> moving vector videos, I would be so proud. So the, there's ways to do it, but I'm just showing you the starter points. And after you watch the lectures, um, he for, for this introductory level stuff, he gets quite deep in this lecture and in these vector examples, but it's all building from these earlier lectures that he does so well on. And then if you sail through these, uh, work on them till you get mastery, and then go back to the notebook and make sure you get it. You understand all the principles he taught here and the whole notebook, now you've built this amazing mental foundation for you to start really understanding linear algebra. 
at a deep level. All right, now I want to go into questions. And uh, you can put them in the chat or come off mute, either way, whatever you prefer. Okay, Papa, um, there, there are some questions I have. Um, there was this deep learning textbook I was reading and they said that every feature in every feature in in a data set that you're playing with is actually part of the matrix and that you have to make you have two matrices you have the feature matrix and the label or the targets the target matrix so um, i'm now wondering um, somebody also suggested that that's why they encourage you to normalize and do the standardization on your piece of data. And that what that does is it brings the weights, um, it, bring, it brings all of them together under the same weights so that it's between zero and one instead of having values just flying around like that. So I'm, I'm thinking um, now, that I, I, now that we've talked about vectors, how, how do how does it does it imply that um, all the features in a particular features matrix they are moving towards the same direction or is that is that could that possibly be why it's 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 required that you drop those features that are not going in the same direction as the others could that be the reason? So you're asking a lot, son, and we're getting there. Let me tell you where we're going. Now, if you guys can't stand it and you want to work ahead, uh, with the exception of this, this post, if you go through these early posts that I did a while back, um, and this is me creating basic linear algebra tools and pure Python without NumPy and SciPy, I just always have to qualify. I love non NumPy and SciPy. I just want to make sure I understand what those artists of those codes are doing um, to, to make NumPy so beautiful. Now, they're not doing it in pure Python. They're doing it in C with some old... C libraries, and then they're converting it to Python so we can use it easier. But it, it's for knowledge's sake that I do this without NumPy or SciPy. And then I do all these linear algebra tricks in pure Python and even get to this point where I do um, least squares, which gets to what you just asked, Hugo. This is where you have features. Each feature is truly a vector. Does that help a little bit, Hugo? It does, it does, but I'm, I'm trying to process how it works. Yes, so I'm trying to say, I'm helping you cross a really wide river and there are stepping stones right under the surface of the river. And I'm just trying to make sure in this lecture series, we don't jump, we, we take one stone at a time. <laughs> and so we're not far from what you're asking. We can get there pretty quickly. There will be some detours we take away from what Saul's teaching and venture into data science. With, for example, well, how the, there are many problems in data science we can solve without gradient set. We can, we can just use ordinary least squares. And that may be Greek to you right now, but I assure you after a few lectures in, maybe two or three, we'll see, we'll already be able to solve from scratch with using NumPy alone, um, a data science modeling problem. And we'll, we'll get there. We're, we, we are going to relate the linear algebra to data science. And I'm very eager for you all to watch this lecture. And I'm hoping someone will add to this copy of the notebook what they learned from this last lecture.
because he does something pretty cool there and you'll you'll see it right away and uh if you don't if you're having trouble uh doing that we'll we'll try to do it together so excellent question you go but let's keep checking back with that question as we go through the next lectures but if you if you guys practice watch all these on your own go through these practices redo the notebook on your own see if you can take it to the next level and then watch ahead you'll be well prepared you guys will be next level data scientists if you get you don't have to know all of linear algebra and all of calculus and all of statistics what you want to do is get good at figuring out the order of those stepping stones in each of those branches of math and science so that you can begin to understand the data science deeper. <clears throat> now, I understand all this for other reasons too, for engineering modeling reasons, for like physical system dynamics. And I'm not just talking uh, mechanical systems, mechanical, electrical, chemical. Um, I use linear algebra in those arts too, in those modeling arts. And, uh, they're, they're very closely related to what we do in data science, but not exactly. But um, this stuff's beautiful. But it's like, that's why I liken it to taking a really long hike. It's going to take days, months. Uh, that, that longest hikeable trail I've shared with you all many times from the tip of South Africa to the east coast of Russia. If you do that on foot, three and a half years, there's gonna be many times where you have to stop, where you might get injured and have to heal, where you have to reprovision, you maybe need to take a couple of days off or more. Our journey is like that in these analytic arts, but longer. <laughs> so don't worry about not accomplishing a lot in a year. If you stay consistent, you'll accomplish a whole lot in a decade or less, but don't be in a hurry. Enjoy the beauty along the way. Enjoy understanding deeply each step. So if you guys understand this real well, what we went over today and what Saul's going to go over for you in this section, you are going to do great as we go through this together. And I'm excited too, because like I've encouraged y'all many times, when you relearn something, you learn it deeper. And you should, ex you, it's good if you can experiment deeper than you did in the past too. And that's why we do things like these notebooks. When you see me create my uh, graph videos where the, the, the graphs are dynamic, um, that's for me to understand things deeper, but also to share it. And then I just wanna share, in case y'all haven't seen this post. Go over here to post activity. I'll look at my latest post. And I just want to, in case y'all haven't seen it, I'm going to pause this video. I can control it right here on the slider. You can see I've got these, all these metrics changing according to what confusion matrix I'm referencing on this receiver operator characteristic curve. Well, I'm eager for you guys to create your own versions of these for what we just went over. You know, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying if someone did it and it, and it was something that helped us understand everything better, I would be ecstatic. But it's not just about the videos, it's about creating visualizations that take us to that next level of understanding. So, um, but even if you just create new plots from what you learn in here, that would be awesome. Um, one fun thing to do though, is you could dynamically show these vectors growing and then show how adding them together just forms this blue one. Anyway, we'll see. All right, um, I'm gonna hope that, let's see, Guy hasn't messaged me. Let's just see if he mess, he doesn't, I guess he's gonna teach. So I hope y'all will show up to hear him teach. 
I'm going to go listen to him teach before mentoring. And uh, I hope y'all are liking this. If you're too afraid to tell me what stinks, what needs to be better, please tell Hugo. He'll tell me. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> we're, I think we're... MS MS likes it. MS likes it. She just pull up some oh. in the charts. Yeah. Oh no, no, that's great. Oh, thank you. Yes. Now, you're it, Manupriya. No, yeah. Oh wait, Manupriya. Well, like MS MS for short. That's MS. That's okay. Nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you liked it. But guys, we can, in, in the family, we care about helping each other in continual improvement. And I still need to grow as a teacher. So it helps you go and I to do better on these classes we're facilitating. If you share with me what was, what was uh, hard for you to understand. But if you, if you did understand everything perfectly, great. But even then think, you know, Tom, maybe if you explained it this way, that would help others. We love all of that. And I hope that many of you will teach courses like this, that that's, that's what we ask of you is to pay it forward. All right. Enough jabbering. Uh, send Hugo or I a message if you have suggestions or we do appreciate thanks too, because we both need encouragement for what we're doing together also. And we'll continue with this next Saturday. Right. Right. All right. Thank you, Papa. All right, guys. See you over at guides class and then in mentoring, hopefully. Right. If you can. Take care. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're going to share. If you don't have the notebook right now, we're going to get it across to you on. We're going to get it across to you um, through 